In this video, we'll cover Jeremiah chapter 6. Open your Bible to Jeremiah chapter 6. And as with a lot of Jeremiah, uh, the chapter here covers the impending invasion uh, from the Babylonians and the ultimate captivity of um, the people of Judah. Uh, this chapter also specifically looks at Jerusalem, the siege against Jerusalem and their captivity. So Jeremiah is prophesying this. It's hard to sometimes uh, put Jeremiah's prophecies in any type of chronological order, but he's predicting this coming calamity. So let's look at verse 1. O you children of Benjamin, gather yourselves to flee from the midst of Jerusalem, blow the trumpet in Tekoa, and set up a signal fire in Beth Hasarim. Well, what he's saying here basically is that uh, the Babylonians... Uh, are coming, and it's speaking of the time when uh, the signal fire will be set up. And um, what that was in this area called Beth Hasarim, um, which was one of the highest points in Judah. It was on a summit west of Jerusalem. And they would light fires to uh, signal impending invasions or to set up an alarm if an enemy uh, army was coming and they would light uh, these fires on top of that summit and s basically send smoke signals to warn the people of Jerusalem and surrounding areas of, of Judea. Uh, and because of, for disaster appears out of the north, and that's a reference, of course, to the coming Babylonian um, army. Now, they were not coming at the time that this was written. This is a prophecy. Uh, Jeremiah is speaking of, of what will happen to them. And he mentions uh, both Benjamin and Tekoa. Um, Benjamin, of course, was one of the smallest tribes in Israel, if not the smallest. And it was originally situated just north of Judah. In fact, uh, uh, this is something people don't often realize, is that Jerusalem was actually in Benjamin, the tribe of Benjamin in the southern part. Uh, close to the border of Judah, but in Benjamin and not in Judah. It's an interesting point. But eventually, Benjamin would sort of become more or less absorbed within the tribe of Judah as far as the, the geographical uh, designation. Although as a tribe, they kept their identity. Paul could say that he was of the tribe of Benjamin and so on. Um, and so Tekoa is a town in the southernmost part of the tribe of Judah, almost down in the desert as you get close to Egypt. Uh, so uh, he's speaking of both uh, the, uh, the northernmost part of Judah, so to speak, and the southernmost part of Judah, the whole land. Uh, this warning is being uh, uh, given that they would eventually flee, would have to flee. I should say also uh, that Tekoa in the southern part of Judah was the hometown of the prophet Amos. So the disaster appears from the north and a great destruction. And then verse 2, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a lovely and delicate woman. Uh, the shepherds with their uh, flock shall come to her. They shall pitch their tents against her all around. Each one shall pasture in his own place. So it's a description of the people of, of, Ju of the city of Jerusalem specifically and describing uh, the Babylonians as, as shepherds pitching their tents round about the city. Then verse 4, prepare war against her, rise up and let us go at noon. Woe to us for the day goes away, for the shadows of the evening are lengthening. Arise, let us go by night and let us destroy her palaces. It's sort of uh, metaphorically putting the words uh, of, of in the mouth of the Babylonians when that time would come. <clears throat> and then uh, verse from verse 6 to verse 8, we get the siege of Jerusalem described. Nebuchadnezzar would eventually siege uh, Jerusalem and there would be starvation within the city and so on. So again, this is a prophecy. It hasn't happened yet when uh, Jeremiah wrote this. Verse six, for thus saith the Lord of hosts, cut down the trees and build a mound uh, against Jerusalem. This is the city. Uh, this is the city to be punished. She is full of oppression and her midst. So he's given the reason why. Uh, this was going to happen to her. As a fountain wells up with water, so she wells up with her wickedness. She's like a fountain welling up wickedness. Uh, violence and plundering are heard in her. Before me continually are grief and wounds. 
Be instructed, O Jerusalem, lest my soul depart from you, lest I make you desolate, a land not inhabited. Well, we're getting the, the reasons for the uh, uh, invasion and siege of, of Jerusalem are given to us here. And then verse 9, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, They shall thoroughly glean as a vine the remnant of Israel, as a grape gatherer put your uh, put your hand back into the branches. Uh, so uh, he describes um, uh, the people of Judah, the Jews here, uh, as a remnant. It's only a remnant of the greater house of Israel. Because remember, the northern tribes had already been taken into captivity some hundred years before by the Assyrians. So they're really even a remnant themselves. The judgment has come upon the people of Israel. And this remnant that's left uh, will be like a, a, a grape gatherer that uh, when he's finished his picking, decides to put his hand back in and glean what is left from the branches. Um, so it's it's a metaphor. It's a, sort of a graphic uh, description of uh, what would happen to them. So verse 10, <clears throat> To whom shall I speak and give warning that they may hear? Indeed, their ear is uncircumcised, uh, and they cannot give heed. Behold, the word of the Lord is reproach to them. They have no delight in it. Therefore, I am full of the fury of the Lord. I am weary of holding it in. I will pour it out on the uh, children outside and on the assembly of the young man together. For even the husband shall be taken with the wife, the aged with him who is full of days. And their houses shall be turned over to others, fields and wives together. For I will stretch out my hand against the inhabitants of the land, says the Lord. So again, we get the uh, coming captivity destruction of the city of Jerusalem and the people of Israel taken the captivity. Many would be slain in that process, uh, would not even get the Babylon. Um, and so it's graphically described in these verses that it would touch everyone, the children, the parents, the husbands, the wives. It, it, it is, God's hand will be stretched on the inhabitants of the land, it says in verse 12, from the least of them to the greatest of them. Uh, uh, everyone is given to covetousness. This, again, we get the reason God speaks about his judgment, what is coming, and then he, he gives the reason for that judgment. Uh, everyone is covetous, uh, the prophet, from the prophet even to the priest. You know, they were corrupted uh, by money. And then he goes on to describe them. Everyone deals falsely. Then verse 14, they also have healed the hurt of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. You know, uh, we get a very similar thing in the um, uh, book of Jer uh, book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel speaks of this the very same thing in chapter thirteen, uh, verse ten. Because indeed they have seduced my people, saying peace, peace, when there is no peace, and one builds a wall and they plaster it with untempered mortar. Uh, he's speaking of the the prophets here and how they plastered the wall with untempered mortars. In other words, they painted the wall white, but the fact is that underneath it was uh, it, it was cracked and ready to crumble. It looked good on the outside, but it was, it was not sturdy. It would fall. So they made things look better uh, than they really were. Uh, they were saying, peace, peace, but actually there is no peace. The Babylonians were coming, but the prophets were saying, oh, this will never happen. Well, this is what we saw when we looked at chapter 5, wasn't it? In verse 30 and 31, an astonishing or appalling and horrible thing has been committed in the land. The prophets prophesied falsely, and the priests rule by their own power. My people love to have it so, but what will you do in the end? The people love to have it so. Their, their prophets and priests were corrupt, and they were corrupted by money. The people were paying money to tell them what they wanted to hear, and not what God was really saying. Uh, this is the point of the passage. And in verse 14, where it says, they have healed the hurt of my people slightly. It can be translated lightly. What that means is they have healed it superficially, just like that untempered mortar Ezekiel spoke of. They they healed their wounds uh, superficially, saying, you know, yeah, well, it looks like the Babylonians are stirring up and they may come and all this, but you know, it's okay. God's going to work out. It's nothing. It's no problem. This won't really happen. And so they were false prophets, and their healing was superficial. They made them feel good. For a little while, but the the deadly disease was still there, and uh, they couldn't deny it. Eventually, verse fifteen, 
Uh, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? No, they were not ashamed, uh, nor did they know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At that the time I will punish them. They shall be cast down, says the Lord. I think that's in reference more to the uh, uh, to the priests and the prophets than to the people generally. You know, were they ashamed or embarrassed to be telling the people these lies? And eventually they would fall themselves and perish themselves. This is what we have, and they would be cast down. We get that in the end of verse 15. And then uh, verse 15, then verse 16 now. Thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and see. Ask for the old paths, where is the good way, and walk in it. Then you'll find rest for your souls. Uh, there's an exhortation here to stand in the ways. Uh, the ways here could be translated crossroads. It's like they were at a crossroads, and there was two roads. There was a road that they were continually going on, a road that took them away from the Lord, took them away from his word, took them away from his revelation, took them away from godliness. And the other road uh, was the old ways, the old called here the old paths. That would be the Lord's teachings from the from the scriptures and the Mosaic law and everything that had been revealed to them that they were to do as obedient Israelites. That's the other road. So they were at the crossroads. Choose which road to take. And if you choose the old paths, you know, there's always hope for those who turn to the Lord, isn't there? If you choose the old paths and walk in it, then you will find rest for your souls. You know, this reminds us also, doesn't it, of Matthew's Gospel, chapter 11, verse 29, where the Lord Jesus says, you know, all you that labor and heavy laden, come unto me, you know. Learn from me, take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, and you'll find rest unto your souls. Well, that's the New Testament version, is taking Christ's yoke upon us, learning from him and following his footsteps. And there we find rest for our souls. This is sort of the Old Testament version of that. But they said, we will not walk in it. So they made their decision. They were at the crossroads and they, choose the ro they chose the road of iniquity. And then verse 17, also, um, I set watchmen over you saying, listen to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, we will not listen. Now the watchmen are the true prophets like himself and Ezekiel and, and some of the other minor prophets. We mentioned Amos, he was one of them, and Hosea and all of these prophets. They were the watchmen, but they they refused to listen to that trumpet sound from the prophets, that warning. They will not listen. Verse 18, therefore, hear you, you nations, hear you nations, and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring certainly bring calamity upon this people. And this is a striking uh, verse um, because Jeremiah, or the Lord through Jeremiah, is saying, is calling the nations uh, to behold this situation. Nations, look at this people, Israel. In fact, he goes out to the whole earth. He says, O earth, hear, O earth, behold, I will bring certainly bring calamity on this people. Uh, God is telling the nations and the whole earth to look at what happens to the people who disobeyed him as an object lesson, a moral lesson for themselves. That's, uh, that's uh, shocking, isn't it? You know, God's people should be a moral lesson to those who are not saved or those who are outside by their righteous behavior, by their godly behavior, that should be a lesson. But when God's people become an object lesson of sin, uh, of, of uh, what happens to people when they reject God, that's, that's pretty so sad. You know, but judgment begins first at the house of God, doesn't it? Peter tells us that. And so <clears throat> it begins first uh, with uh, the people of Israel, here specifically the people of Judah and Jerusalem. Um, but um, eventually, you know, we'll see that the Babylonians not only took uh, Judah in the captivity, but the Babylonians would attack many nations, would attack Moab and Edom, it would attack uh, Syria, would attack uh, Egypt, would attack Lebanon. Uh, the Babylonians attacked everything. Um, and so these nations should look at what would happen to Judah first. So verse 20, for what purpose to me comes frankincense from Sheba and sweet cane from a far country? Your burnt offerings are not acceptable, nor your sacrifices sweet to me. The sweet sacrifice, of course, are the sweet savor offerings we find in, for example, Leviticus chapter 1, you know, the burnt offering, the grain offerings, 
or the trespass, not the trespass offerings, but the, the grain offerings and the burnt offerings, they were, and the peace offerings, they were the sweet savor offerings. Uh, and, um, uh, but the Lord is saying here that they're not sweet to me. They're not sweet to me because uh, even if you have the most uh, expensive frankincense, you know, frankincense was connected with the grain offering, Leviticus chapter 2. Uh, you can get the nicest material for your worship, for your offerings. But if the, if the behavior, if the interior, if the heart is far from God, these things are meaningless to him. You get the same thing in Isaiah. If you want to turn over Isaiah chapter 1, uh, verse 11, Isaiah says, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me? says the Lord. I have enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of cattle. Uh, I do not delight in the blood of bulls or the lam or lambs or goats. When you come to me, uh, appear before me who has required this from your hand to trample my courts. Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moons and the Sabbaths and the calling of assemblies I cannot endure iniquity and uh, and the sacred meeting of your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates they are a trouble to me i'm weary of bearing them when you spread out your hands i will hide my eyes from you even though you make many prayers i will not hear your hands are full of blood see their hands were full of blood full of violence and 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 corruption and um so when they brought the offerings up to the temple in jerusalem God said, I'm not, I'm not receiving that. I'm not accepting that. And as we have in our chapter here in Jeremiah chapter 6, uh, for what purpose to me, uh, verse 20, comes frankincense from Sheba. You know, they get the best of frankincense, the most expensive uh, of the spices, all the way from the country of Sheba uh, to Jerusalem. And that's a, God said, that doesn't impress me. And that's the same for us too. You know, we can have the, the most stylistic worship um, uh, we can have, you know, trained singers. We can have all these things. And we, sometimes we see these in some circles. Um, uh, we can have a beautiful building. Uh, we can dress nice, you know, all these things. But if the heart is far from God, what, that's not, an, doesn't impress God. Doesn't impress God. He's looking for the heart. He's looking for the heart. And so we have it here. Now, verse 21. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will lay stumbling blocks uh, before this people. And the fathers and the sons together shall fall on them. The neighbor and his friend shall perish. Thus says the Lord. Uh, here's the reason why. Uh, behold, the people comes from the north country. A people comes from the north country. The people from the north country, of course, are the Babylonians. The Babylonian nation, the Chaldeans, Nebuchadnezzar and his crew. And a great nation will be raised from the farthest parts of the earth. Again, the Babylonians. But notice raised. God raised them up. He lifted them up to be a, a judgment against his people, Israel. If, it's interesting. It's not until chapter 20 of Jeremiah that we actually get the Babylonians first named. If we turn over to Jeremiah chapter 20 and verse 4. It says there, for thus says the Lord, behold, I will make you a terror to yourself and to all your friends, and they shall fall by the sword of their enemies, and your eyes shall see it. I will give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall carry them captive to Babylon and slay them with the sword. Here, Babylon is mentioned for the first time by name, but he's being described in chapter 6, obviously. Uh, but notice it says, I will give uh, all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon. God has done this. God will do this. God raised up uh, the Babylonians. And we see this in the prophet Daniel. If you go to Daniel chapter 2, verse 37. Daniel chapter 2, verse 37. And of course, this is the dream that King Nebuchadnezzar had of the great image with the head of gold and so on. And he was the head of gold in that dream that he had. Daniel interpreted it for him. And in verse 37, it says, You, O king, are a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given you a kingdom, power, strength, and glory. And wherever the children of men dwell, or the beasts of the field, or the birds of the air of heaven, 
He has given them into your hand and has made you ruler over them all. You are this head of gold. See, God had, God gave the kingdom to Nebuchadnezzar. And, and it can't be stressed enough or, or over uh, emphasized enough that what we have here uh, predicted by Jeremiah and what eventually happened, the Babylonian captivity of the Jewish people, what a profound change this would be in the position of the people of Israel, the Jewish people, uh, in relation to the earth. You know, God had set his name there. He had set his throne there. He had set his presence there in Jerusalem. And uh, in the book of Ezekiel describes the glory, chapters 8, 9, 10, and 11, that area of Ezekiel, the glory departing, lifting up from the temple and from the city of Jerusalem and leaving the city before the destruction by the hand of the Babylonians. God was removing his throne from the earth, from the kingdom that was given to Israel, was taken away from them and given into the hands of the Gentiles, starting with the Babylonians. And it still today is in the hands of the Gentile nations. Uh, um, we call this, there's a, a biblical word for it, the times of the Gentiles. It starts with Babylon, it ends with the Roman Empire, and there will be a final last um reviving of that Roman Empire uh, during the days of the beast and Antichrist. We won't get into all that detail. Uh, but I just wanted to show that it was God that removed the kingdom from the people of Israel and had given it to the Gentiles. And so today we are in the hands of the Gentiles. And this is what is being predicted. Behold, a people comes from the north country. A great nation will be raised from the farthest parts of the earth. Verse 22. And then verse 23 and they will lay hold on bow and spear. They are cruel and have no mercy. Their voice roars like the sea. And they ride on horses as men of war set in array against you, O daughter of Jerusalem. So there you have it. And it continues on in verse 24. We have heard the report of it. Our hands grow feeble. Anguish has taken hold of us. Pain as of a woman in labor. You know, when a woman goes into labor, she goes into pain. And it's difficult. And uh, this has particular resonance for the people of that era when they heard this, because childbirth then was far more dangerous than it is now. <clears throat> and um, they didn't have the, the uh, medical uh, facilities and helps that today if a woman gets into trouble during childbirth. And, um, but it's described as a labor, a woman in labor, and the pain associated with that. Um, because of the sword of the enemy, fears on every side. O daughter of my people, verse 26, dress in sackcloth, roll about in ashes, make mourning as for an only son. Most bitter lamentation for the plunderer will suddenly come upon us. Again, the Babylonians will come upon us, uh, Jeremiah predicts. And then he has a description in verse uh, 27 uh, to the end as, as a, a refining process where uh, silver is put into a refiner, into the fire, and is in this fire to, uh, in order that the alloys would be, uh, would be uh, purged out of the silver, that it would become pure. But uh, it, what he's describing here is Israel, and the, the fire of the furnace are the calamities that have come upon Israel, yet the alloys uh, were not removed, no matter how hot the fire was. Uh, the, the 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 iniquity was so bad uh, that the that the alloys and the impurities could not be extracted from it. Well, let's just read it, verse twenty seven. I have set you as an assayer and a fortress among my people, that you may know and test their way. Uh, he's speaking there of, of the Babylonians, there that they would be like this tester, uh, this refiner. They are all stubborn rebels. That's his people, walking as slanderers. They are bronze and iron they are all corruptors the bellows blow fiercely that's the bellows of of the of the furnace the uh, refining furnace the lead is consumed by the fire the smelter refines in vain for the wicked are not drawn off the impurities are not drawn off uh, people will call them rejected silver because the lord has rejected them so god uh, tried and he brought them into trial and he brought them into testing and he sent prophets to them and sent difficulties among them to see if the iniquity could be purged away, but they never repented. 
So it was like the refiner looking at his end product, looking at the silver and saying, no, it's uh, it's impure. I can't use this and just throwing it away. And that's what the Lord is saying here about the people of Israel, that they will be rejected and they're going to be taken. Uh, the Lord's going to send them into Babylon. Of course, we know that they were not rejected permanently. God had mercy and would bring them back. That's another story. But just as far as this passage is concerned, this is what is being described. So there's, in all these things, you know, beloved, there's uh, voices to us. God brings trials into our lives and we should listen to the voice. Listen to what God is saying and not just reject it, not uh, judge ourselves, search our hearts and see God, why have you allowed this? It may not be for anything particular, but it's good to examine oneself and um, and to, to have a soft heart, walk humbly and softly before your God and search and see if there be any wicked way in me, the psalmist says. I think that's good for us too. And the Lord will help us through. May the Lord encourage you today as you consider Jeremiah chapter 6. Amen.